For over two decades, the identity of Melissa Witt's killer has been hidden in the uneven ground of a remote mountaintop in the Ozark National Forest. When the beautiful 19-year-old disappeared on December 1, 1994, the town of Fort Smith was shaken to its core. Melissa's murder shattered the illusion that Fort Smith was a safe community. The sleepy little Ozark town was wide awake and no one would ever be the same again. She was well liked by everybody and, it, and this, especially in this day and age, it seems like everybody has got an enemy of some sort and it just, you know, everywhere we went, people knew her. She just, she had one of those smiles that and her eyes lit up and I just, anybody who had the the pleasure of meeting Missy would always remember her. Melissa began working as a dental assistant in high school. The former cheerleader and honor student was blossoming into an independent and ambitious young woman pursuing her dreams. Her diary paints a picture of someone who lived life to the fullest. Melissa and her mother had a very close relationship. Their faith was the center of their lives. They regularly attended Grand Avenue Baptist Church and Melissa wrote about her faith in her diary. Her mom was so protective of her. I mean, everywhere we went, we the elementary school we went to was right, right one street over from where we lived and we would play there all day long and come, as soon as it started to get dusk, you could hear her mom, her mom called her Melissa and you could just hear her yell, Melissa, you know, we all, and we would come running. Thursday, December 1st, 1994, was just another ordinary day in Fort Smith. The community was counting down the days until Christmas. Everything seemed picture perfect in this little town, but that reality was shattered for Melissa Ann Witt. It was a typical morning. Melissa woke early to prepare for class. Before leaving that morning, she asked her mom to borrow money. When Mary Ann said no, the two argued briefly and Melissa left for class. After class, Melissa and a friend grabbed a quick lunch at Chick-fil-A and Melissa went on to her job. At 5 p.m., Melissa clocked out and hopped into her 1995 white Mitsubishi Mirage and discovered the car battery was dead. She came in to find out about jump-starting it, and we decided to go out and, and jump-start a car, and we were able to get someone from next door to help us. And she jump-started the car. It started just fine. She realized that she'd left the lights on from being at the mall, and we left. When Melissa got home, she found a note from her mother inviting her to Bowling World so the two of them could eat hamburgers while Mary Ann bowled. It was a scenario that had played out dozens of times. Mary Ann never saw Melissa at the bowling alley that night and assumed that her only daughter had decided to go out with friends. Mary Ann left Bowling World fully expecting to see Melissa later that evening, but as hours passed by with no word from Melissa, Mary Ann began to worry. Where was Melissa? As midnight came, turning Thursday into Friday, fear set in. It wasn't like Melissa not to leave a note or to call and let her mother know where she would be. Mary Ann began to call Melissa's closest friends, and by 3 a.m., she was driving the streets, frantically searching for her only child. I, her mom called our house about, I don't know what time it was, two in the morning. All I know is that was, I was asleep, and my mom woke me up and said, Tara, Mary Ann's on the phone and wants to know if you know where Melissa is. She never came home last night. And I said, no, but we, we had plans for, that was, Friday morning, early Friday morning, and we had plans to go out that night. And I said to her, no, I haven't heard from her, but I'm supposed to see her in class tomorrow, and we're supposed to go out tomorrow night. And no one ever saw her, obviously, after that. At 9 a.m. on Friday, December 2nd, when it became clear that Melissa was not coming home, Mary Ann called the Fort Smith Police Department. A patrolman was dispatched to the Witt home. He collected general information about Melissa. Age, weight, height, where was Melissa last seen? And then he asked a question that would dramatically alter the trajectory of the missing person investigation that would follow. Had there been some kind of argument? Mary Ann recounted the brief disagreement the two had over money that Thursday morning. The supposed argument that Melissa and her mother had on December the 1st, um, I believe the patrolman misunderstood what was going on. He thought it was a, a case of where Melissa and her mother had got into it and she had 
just left the residence and would be back in a day or two. As Marianne assured the patrolman that the disagreement was not serious, he took notes, already formulating his opinion on Melissa's whereabouts. She was, was never the type to just run away, which I think is usually the, what the police first think has happened is maybe it's just a disgruntled teenager or college kid that's moved out or, you know, got in a fight with her parents. And I knew that wasn't the case because she wasn't like that. So I knew, knew something was weird, but I don't think you ever want to take your mind to that something bad has happened. So you figure, oh, something, something weird just happened, but I'm sure things okay. Mary Ann never imagined that mentioning this one small disagreement would impact the search for her missing daughter. At 19, Melissa was considered an adult, and in the United States, it is not illegal for an adult to go missing. Police get missing person reports every day, Fort Smith and all over, uh, especially with young, young people run, getting mad at their parents and running off. So this was a routine, routine call for the patrolman. He treated it as such, and that's the reason it laid on a, on a detective's desk as just another missing person that she would show up in a day or two. The patrolman left that morning assuring Marianne that he had seen this scenario play out hundreds of times before. He assured her that Melissa would be home soon. But Marianne Witt knew in her heart he was wrong. It did not take long for Melissa's friends and family to spring into action. A massive search ensued. Thousands of flyers were distributed throughout the River Valley. Uh, Melissa's been a, a member of our Pride of West Ark Student Ambassador Group for about two years. Uh, very, very likable girl, very personable. Uh, highly unlikely that she would do anything like this in, in my knowledge of her. And uh, we're just kind of all surprised and shocked. And so we are very concerned, obviously. My mom and I, we and my dad, we would, you know, go to their house and we helped with flyers. We, you know, put up flyers, talk to people. Um, you know, we're sort of desperate for information, and so it was. It was a, a part of it was, I think, total disbelief. You didn't really think it didn't feel real at the time, but at the same time, you're you're trying everything you could to to find some sort of happy ending. Days ticked by, still no Melissa. It's upset me. I want her. I want her back. I want my friend back, and I want my sister back, and our friends want her back, and her mom wants her back, and her dad wants her back, and if it's a joke, it's gone far enough. The media learned of the massive search that was underway for Melissa Witt and took an immediate interest. The same day news stations began airing footage of the concerns of possible foul play in Melissa's disappearance, law enforcement received a phone call from a Bowling World employee who reported that on Thursday evening, December 1st, a Bowling Alley customer turned in a set of keys that he and his family found in the parking lot at approximately 7.45 p.m. The name spelled out on the keychain, Missy. Three days after the initial report of Melissa Witt was marked as a runaway case, the tide shifted. The Witt case was now in the hands of the Fort Smith Police Department's Major Crimes Unit. With boots on the ground, the Witt case was now gaining traction. A uh, couple of days after Melissa had went missing, some of her friends showed up down at the police department and had posters printed and uh, were distributed them trying to find out what was going on with her case. And at that point, you know, I wasn't even aware of her being missing. Uh, I tracked down the report and told the friends, you know, that we would look into it and uh, see if there was something more than her just running off because they were in so insistent that this was just way out of character for her. A set of keys had been turned in on December the 1st around 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night. These turned out to be Melissa Witt's car keys. They had a spot of blood on them. That was her blood. And then the ultimate discovery. 
Melissa's 1995 Mitsubishi Mirage was found in the Bowling World parking lot. Near her car, investigators also discovered pools of blood, a gold hoop earring, and a crushed hair clip. Whoever abducted her, approached her at, uh, as she got out of the car. Apparently they had a conversation, and apparently some kind of a conflict. Got into an argument, she was hit in the upper right side of her skull. Uh, it was a contusion. It also caused quite a bit of bleeding. Anytime you have a scalp wound, you have quite a bit of bleeding. And there were drops of blood uh, that she left in behind her car. And as she was either drug or forced across into the next parking section directly north of where she was at, that's when the bleeding stopped and she was taken at that point, placed in another vehicle and taken away from the parking lot. These clues pointed to something much more sinister than a runaway teenager. The race to find Melissa was now in full swing. Every second mattered. Investigators knew that the first 48 hours was a critical window in a missing person's investigation, and they were now well beyond that window of time. I, I don't think we, any of us know what we would do, so I, I couldn't say specifically what she would do in any given situation, but we don't even know what the situation is truly, <laughs> uh, except that she, she is gone. And so uh, I just uh, I just pray that that whoever has her will have compassion and uh, will release her if, if she's you know if she's uh, with someone like that. Determined not to leave any stone unturned, investigators looked closer at the last place Melissa was known to be, Bowling World. Investigators were stunned to learn that not only was there no surveillance footage of the parking lot, but there had also been no security on site that evening. As it turned out, Bowling World only employed private security for the premises for weekends and alternate weekdays. It just so happened there was no security present on Thursday, December 1st, 1994. Investigators turned to surrounding businesses in hopes their security footage would give any sort of clue to Melissa's whereabouts. Another dead end. It was relief, I guess, that they found the car, but then it was, it was more like, well, now it's, where is she, you know? Maybe if they'd found, since they hadn't found the car, maybe she was still with the car, you know, just out, gone to see somebody. I think the, the longer it goes by, they haven't found her that, it's not that, I think it's something else. Here's, here's a teenager that, that was going out one night and all of a sudden she, hadn't, she was never seen again. And so I think a lot of parents took heart to that or took it to heart saying, um, uh, maybe having a little bit more contact with her kids. You know, where are you going and, and who can, where are you gonna be and how can I get a hold of you and you know, that sort of thing. Investigators combed through police files and interrogated local sex offenders. The process was cumbersome. It would be two more years before the Sex Offender Registry Act in Arkansas would be enacted. Investigators were determined and interviewed hundreds of possible suspects in the days and weeks that followed. Interview after interview led to nothing but dead ends. And then a glimmer of hope. In partnership with local media, law enforcement made a plea to the public for information. Anyone who had been at Bowling World on Thursday evening was asked to call the Fort Smith Police Department. Suddenly, the phones started ringing off the hook, and the first red herring of the case emerged. A caller claimed that around 6.30 p.m. on December 1st, they witnessed a white female matching the description of Melissa Ann Witt arguing with an African-American male. A composite sketch was drawn and released to the media, and suddenly the story took on a life of its own. Rumors that Melissa led a secret life and owed money for a drug debt grew like wildfire. The all-American girl had been kidnapped by an African-American male and taken over state lines into the small community of Fort Coffey, Oklahoma. Witnesses came forward claiming to have seen Melissa being held hostage. The uh, theory behind it was Melissa was involved with drug dealers in uh, eastern Oklahoma and she was kidnapped because of that. Well, nothing in her background indicates that. 
Nothing in her circle of friends and family connect her to that. Uh, so we had to spend quite a bit of time on that and uh, find out what, where that story led. There was no trace of Melissa in Fort Coffee, and yet those rumors have forever impacted the Wit investigation. As the days slowly turned into weeks, the aftershocks of Melissa Witt's disappearance began to take hold. People began to lock their doors at night. Curfews were implemented. Everyone was on edge. And just the, the knowledge that this girl had been, you know, snatched up from this parking lot and, and that it happened where there were, there were people around and it wasn't, you know, 2 a.m. when it happened or something, but just, just the manner, the, the brazen way that it happened. I think made a lot of us very, very scared, you know, to, to and, and I know people are murdered, you know, scores of people are murdered every day, but this one really stuck out um, because of who she was and kind of the, the outcry that resulted. So I, I think that anybody living in that region at that time was very, very aware of Missy Witt, and, and I certainly was. Then, in a stroke of luck, an 11-year-old boy also came forward saying he heard a woman yelling for help in the bowling alley parking lot between 6.30 and 7 p.m. This critical information propelled the case forward. Suddenly, law enforcement had a timeline. The Witt family offered a reward. The fund quickly grew to over $30,000 for information leading to the arrest of those responsible in Melissa's disappearance. One thing I want to say to her, I want to tell her that she's loved more than anything in the world. And I'd just love to have her back. If she's able to see me or to hear me, I love her with all my heart. And uh, again, I want to say I can't name all the people who have, have uh, given, you know, prayer and support. And I want to thank everyone because I can't name them all. They're too numerous. But uh, I appreciate everything that's been done. and and mostly the prayer because there have been so many people praying and I really appreciate that. Friends, family and community members distributed thousands of flyers with Melissa's photo and description throughout the River Valley, including truck stops along Interstate 40 in eastern Oklahoma. Despite their efforts, the case stalled, but not for long. A frightened young woman and her parents contacted Fort Smith PD. The young woman, who chooses to remain anonymous today for her safety, was at the bowling alley on the evening of Melissa's disappearance. That night, December 1st, my dad um, came home and I had grown up at Bowling World before, bowling, before it was Bowling World. So um, I was familiar with kind of what went on there. Um, it wasn't uncommon for there to be a, an argument or a fight. Um, and he came home and I said, so, um, what, um, what happened at the bowling world with the big fight? And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, oh, there was a big argument in the, in the parking lot. And he was like, well, he was like, well, I don't know anything about it. And I was like, well, I guess, as I just wondered if the police got called because I could hear him yelling. And he's like, no, nothing like that. So I don't really remember when. It kind of made the connection, maybe, um, when they discovered where her car was. Because it's kind of all a big blur between, you know, because I, once Dad said, no, I don't remember anything, I just kind of, I guess, put it to the side of it was just an argument in the parking lot and kind of went on with my, with my life. Um, so probably whenever they discovered that was where her car was, um, I can remember my dad saying to me, tell me again what you heard. Tell me again where it was. Um, and he actually drove me, um, he made me shut my eyes and we drove out to Bowling World and he parked me um, in the general area of where we were because we were parked just spaces apart. And he said, show me where you heard it from. And I pointed directly to where the car, the car was still parked. The witness, deemed as credible by law enforcement, was later hypnotized in an attempt to gather more information in Melissa's disappearance. I just heard arguing, bickering, fighting in the parking lot. When I, when I could hear from the argument, it was um, more like bickering. Um, stop, leave me alone, go away. Um, 
to me, she did not sound scared. It sounded like, um, now knowing that I'm older, sounded more like an argument you would have with your spouse. Um, I need you to, I need you to go away and leave me alone. You're, you've annoyed me enough today and you need to stop. That kind of sound to me. Um, she did not sound scared. I was scared, but she did not sound scared to me. Six weeks passed when a phone call came in after hours to the Fort Smith Major Crimes Unit. The caller left a message. In the message, a woman with a heavy Southern accent urged a man, possibly her son or grandson, to tell the police what he had found. Basically, the only thing that she said, are you going to get over here and tell them what you know? And there was a young man, said, just the voice, you know, no. And then they hung up. That's basically all it was. And for it being in that time period, uh, we wouldn't have any idea what else a phone call would be made to the major crimes office for along those lines. Psychologist Jay Hillgardner. This is your 6 o'clock news. Good evening, I'm Bridget Bonds, filling in for Guy West Mullen, who is off tonight. And I'm Burr Edson. A body has been found in Franklin County, and the question is, is the body that of Melissa Witt? Fifty miles away from Fort Smith in the Ozark National Forest, a beautiful landscape of trees and mountains had been hiding a terrible secret. On Friday, January 13th, at 9.40 a.m., two animal trappers about 18 miles north of Ozark stumbled upon what they believed was a mannequin lying face down in the woods about 30 feet off the main road. The two men had walked the same path the day before and said there had been nothing there. As they approached the strange mannequin lying in the woods, it became clear that what they had found was something much worse. The Ozark National Forest gave up the secret it had been hiding on a remote logging road, a decomposing naked body of a young woman. Frantic, the pair immediately called the Franklin County Sheriff's Department and the Fort Smith Major Crimes Unit was brought in. Uh, upon arriving at the scene, we found a white female uh, who is uh, nude, lying uh, for the most part face down off of a National Forest Service road, approximately 30 feet or so off the roadway. And uh, the body had been there for a period of time we do not have an estimation on the time that will be left up for the medical examiner's office. I can tell you that it started out as, uh, as a normal day. I'm not a superstitious guy. It was a Friday the 13th. Uh, it was a, you know, January. And it was a really mild day. I mean, to start with, it was sunshiny, just just a really perfect day. And I was hoping for it to be just a normal day. Uh, get some work done around the office and what have you. And then, of course, with the phone call from Sheriff Ross, all hell broke loose. We get down there, uh, start working the crime scene. probably halfway through gathering up evidence and, and what have you, it came a storm, uh, just a real cold storm, and it was raining so hard, the rain was actually coming down sideways, and the wind was blowing. None of us had jackets or anything else because it was, you know, such a, it started out as such a beautiful day. I remember finding a, a raincoat in my, my car and trying to find another shirt or, or something to try and stay warm because you're out in the elements here. And it, it really turned into a crappy day. It was pretty apparent to us when we got there based on what we saw that it was gonna be her. But of course, we can't make that call. 
So we had to send the body to the crime lab uh, and have the crime lab uh, do fingerprints and do dental work and so forth to make sure it was her. And, and once they did that and they positively identified her, uh, the investigation took its next turn at that point. As dark clouds rolled in on that cold January day, one question was on everyone's mind. Was this the body of Melissa Ann Witt? Really, you don't know what to think because it, you know, it could be from who knows how long ago. Um, but one of the first comments I remember in the newsroom is, um, what are the chances this is Melissa Witt? And it didn't even occur to me at that time because we had covered other things in between that time. And about, I thought, yeah, that could be interesting. And so I, I sent a couple of reporters out there, including Charlene, and it wasn't 45 minutes after she got there, she called me back and said, we've got Melissa Witt's body here. And then, so I just flooded the scene with, with reporters and photographers and prosecutor was out there to make positive ID and the de detectives were out there to make positive ID. And, then the story shifted. Now it's, okay, we've got a murder case, we have a homicide now. Visual identification of the body was impossible due to significant decomposition. The body was sent to the Arkansas State Crime Lab in Little Rock, where dental records revealed that after 45 long days, Melissa Witt had finally been found. So I think when news hit that her body had been found, there was kind of a collective you know, it let the air out of everyone, but then immediately I think there was a, there was a pursuit that began, not just among the police, but among anybody who, you know, was aware of the case and knew about it, to try to figure out what had happened and, and you know, get justice. Um, and that was, that was the horrible thing, was in, you know, knowing, n knowing that she was, was dead and had been found, but also just knowing that somebody's out there who did this. The frantic search for the missing college student was now a murder investigation. Why would someone murder a beautiful, vibrant young woman? A local man came forward with a possible clue. This witness had been hunting in the Ozark National Forest, and he told police that he had seen a man changing clothes next to a dark gray or black car parked along the same logging road where Melissa's body had been discovered. The car had a decal on the passenger side rear quarter panel that was possibly purple or blue. The witness told police that this man did not appear to have any hunting equipment and he seemed out of place. He was described as 20 to 30 years old, approximately 5 feet 11 inches tall, roughly 180 pounds with curly hair. That's all that they observed was him changing clothes, but it was on December the 4th and he was in a vehicle that wouldn't be common to that area. When I say it wouldn't be common to that area, uh, if it wasn't a Jeep or a four-wheel drive pickup, it's, that area is not some place that you take a vehicle as they described. As Melissa Witt's mother and the community began to mourn, investigators began their search for a killer. I just hope that everybody realizes how beautiful she was inside and out and that she was just miss everything i mean she could be the perfect american i mean she had the beautiful heart beautiful soul the medical examiner revealed important information in the autopsy report this information became critical to the investigation melissa's death was officially ruled asphyxiation by strangulation Testing on the leaves and soil found in Melissa's airway and lungs revealed that as she was strangled, Melissa inhaled debris native to the Ozark National Forest. This clue told investigators that Melissa had been killed at or near the location where her body was found. There was trauma on the side of Melissa's head. The wound, believed to have been caused by a blow or a fall in the parking lot of the bowling alley, was determined not to be fatal. This explained the source of the blood found in the parking lot at Bowling World. It also painted a picture of a violent struggle. Melissa's body was found naked, leading authorities to believe she was sexually assaulted. However, due to advanced decomposition on the lower half of her body, the medical examiner could not determine if she had been raped. Melissa had been killed on the same day as her abduction. Her body was hidden away in the Ozark National Forest for 45 long days.
Armed with evidence from the crime scene and the information from the autopsy report, investigators began to build a profile of Melissa's killer. They believed the killer was familiar with the remote mountaintop area where Melissa's body had been discovered. This location meant something to her killer. It's, it's more or less like a single lane driveway or, or what have you, it goes back off the main uh, main gravel road in that area. Actually a logging road where they would, it's been used to clear cut and what have you. Uh, trappers use it, hunters use it, uh, and I'm sure that lots of local kids have used that area. Quite a busy place for to be as remote as what it is. Melissa's body could have been disposed of in many places, but her killer chose to drive an hour from the abduction site to a remote location, an area so isolated that most didn't even know it existed. Two scenarios emerged. The killer was either a local or someone who frequented the area from out of state to hunt. Taken to a place that, that, that is so remote that you can go there and scream anytime at the top of your lungs, anytime, day or night. Nobody's going to hear you. She was alone, and it had to be such a fright to go that long, knowing what was probably going to wind up happening. A more detailed examination of the crime scene shocked investigators. Indentations behind a large headstone-like rock revealed that Melissa Witt's body had initially been hidden away behind the rock between two small trees. According to police records, Melissa's body had visible marks where someone, presumably the killer, had grabbed hold of her in order to move her closer to the road. There's a, there's a big rock that her body was behind the whole time that she was out there. and. We know this from, from hair falling out off the body, how deep it was in, in the soil. Um, we know that she was placed with setting down like on her buttocks, like you would do a setup. It was a person that had to move the body. And the reason I say that, and the reason the medical examiner said that is because if it was a large animal it would have left marks of some kind either teeth or claw marks where it had rolled her but it it was actually a straight drag and there was a, a drag pattern from behind the rock to where her body was at Suddenly, the phone call that came into police the day before Melissa's body was found became significant. Investigators believe the young man who was part of that mysterious phone call may have stumbled upon Melissa's body in the woods and moved it from behind the rock so she would be discovered. I've had two, uh, two lines of thought on that over the years, that if it was the killer, he moved the body just to get a little bit more uh, celebrity status, what have you, out of, out of this, to see, get some more reaction out of the public. But it also could have been people living in that area, knowing that the mother is missing her daughter, the mother hasn't been able to to give the daughter a, a burial or anything else. And with all the news media that's been going on the whole time, I feel like sympathy that, that this person that actually moved the body probably was trying to bring an end to it. Investigators discovered additional clues at the crime scene. Cigarette butts and papers were found near Melissa's body. What is more significant, however, are the items that were missing from the crime scene. Melissa's clothing, shoes, purse, remaining gold hoop earring, and her Mickey Mouse watch were never recovered. It would be fair to say that uh, if the killer 
kept the watch as a trophy, I think you'd have to start getting off into being a serial killer type thing with, with it being a trophy. I think it's more, more or less kept as a memento. Who killed Melissa Witt? Calls poured in, accusations flew, a neighbor did it, a retired police officer did it, their husband's brother did it, everyone was a suspect. Everything from, you know, at one point in time they thought maybe, because the, the bowling world, bowling alley was right next to the interstate, so there was a time period they thought, well maybe it was somebody, you know, some straggler roaming the interstate did it, um, you know, then they thought maybe it's some sort of serial thing and then you know the the hard part is was never it was hard to ever find figure out a person that would want to do this like I said she didn't have any enemies she wasn't she didn't have a boyfriend at the time I mean she we would go out and she'd see guys she thought were cute you know but it was nothing was ever serious with anybody and so it just it was hard to you know hard hard to figure out who in the world would want to do that to her you know and we thought well maybe she had you know, a, a stalker or someone that, you know, was admiring her from afar and we just, no one ever knew of it. Every lead law enforcement tracked down seemed to lead to the same place, a dead end. A rookie reporter working the police and fire beat for the Times Record newspaper in Fort Smith discovered something significant. As Marcus Blair sat in the newsroom flipping through various newspapers, he came across front page news out of Houston. A man named Larry Swearingen had been arrested for the murder of a young college student named Melissa Trotter. Blair immediately began to recognize similarities between the Witt and Trotter murders. And I was a very young, wet behind the ears reporter. I uh, really don't think I knew quite what I was doing. <laughs> And I, I come into the office and, and we received newspapers from all over the place. And we watched TV news and you know, we, we try to stay very aware of what's going on all over the place. And we had the, uh, the Houston newspaper. And it was front page news that this young lady, Melissa Trotter had been killed. And this man, Larry Ray Swearingen was arrested for her murder. And upon seeing her face, Melissa Trotter's face, and seeing her name on that paper, my editor, you know, had picked it up and said, wow, you know, she looks a lot like Melissa Witt, and her name's Melissa. So she passed it on to me when I came in the office. She said, here, Marcus, does, is, isn't this bizarre, you know? So I agreed, but I, you know, I'm a skeptic at first on anything like that. I thought, surely not. Surely this is going to be nothing. But I wanted to check and see if there were any similarities between the cases besides just her appearance and her name. And as I began to kind of draw up a list of similarities, it just got longer and longer and longer. Marcus knew he had to act fast. He contacted the Fort Smith Police Department and scheduled a meeting with J.C. Ryder. And just like that, investigators had their eyes set on a promising new lead in Willis, Texas, 27-year-old Larry Ray Swearingen. He ended up being indicted for capital murder in the death of 19-year-old Montgomery College student Melissa Trotter. Swearingen abducted and strangled Trotter and dumped her body in the Sam Houston National Forest. Investigators were able to track Swearingen's whereabouts in November 1994 to his grandparents' home in Clinton, Arkansas. They had tossed his cell on death row, which was routine. They would, said that the guards would do that at the prison from time to time just to make sure about weapons or any contraband. And they had found uh, lots of paperwork concerning uh, my name, Melissa Witt's name. It was no surprise that Swearingen's legal team kept him from talking to authorities in the Witt case until just before his execution in 2019. Swearingen died, never admitting to the murder of either Melissa Trotter or Melissa Witt. 16 years later, in 2000, another potential suspect came to light, Charles Ray Vines. Vines had been arrested in Fort Smith after breaking into a home and attacking a young girl. During the violent attack, Vines beat the young woman as he tried to sexually assault her. Once he was arrested, the truth about Charles Ray Vines slowly began to unravel. 
Raised in a good home surrounded by love from his mother and the stern discipline from his father, Vines grew up to be respected in the community. He worked in construction, but also often worked alongside his father, a mortician. Eventually, he had a family of his own and appeared to be a loving and attentive father. Charles Ray Vines appeared to be an upstanding member of the Fort Smith community. No one knew Charles Ray Vines was actually hiding a dark secret, an obsession for rape and necrophilia. After his arrest for the attack on the teenage girl, police listened in horror as Vines described how in 1993 he had brutally beaten and raped an elderly woman named Juanita Woford. In 2000, he was convicted of capital murder in the deaths of Walford and Ruth Henderson. During that time, he was interviewed extensively by lead detective J.C. Ryder about the Melissa Witt abduction and murder. Based on those interviews, Ryder no longer considers Vine a suspect in Melissa's murder. In 2019, Vines died of natural causes while incarcerated in an Arkansas maximum security unit near Pine Bluff. Over the years, at least a dozen detectives have passionately worked the Melissa Witt murder investigation. They all agree on one thing, Melissa knew her killer and that she had written his name in her diary. So I, I, my personal theory is that person knew her, that person wanted to find her that night. I don't know if it was for the purpose of abduction and murder, but I think that person wanted to find her that night. And I think that person waited until that car showed up. I think there was an altercation that turned violent at her car door. And I think when that person took her at that point, the events unfolded the way we have found them. She was abducted uh, and murdered. And I think that's how that probably happened. Ryder believes Witt's murderer knew her routines and struggled with an uncontrollable rage toward women. Ryder also suspects he's someone who has spent most of his life battling drug and alcohol addiction, legal troubles, and struggles to maintain relationships with women. I think he's probably been in trouble before, probably doesn't get along well with women. I think uh, he's probably been physical with other women throughout his life and, and just in general has, has problems getting along with women to the point of not being able to keep his hands off of them if an argument comes up. Investigators believe that the frightened young woman who overheard an argument in the Bowling World parking lot that fateful night holds the key to solving this case. Woke up in the middle of the night in a dead panic and saying his name starts with a D, his name starts with a D. And my mom said, what are you talking about? And I said, his name starts with a D. It's difficult to work these cases cold because that's exactly what they've become. They've become cold. People's memories lag. The evidence is not fresh like it used to be. You can't just run out and, and check things. It's not impossible. I've worked cases for four years and then solved them. Uh, JC and I have worked cold cases and solved them. We're convinced we're going to solve this one. Sadly, on Sunday, March 20th, 2011, in Fort Smith, Arkansas, 75-year-old Mary Ann Witt passed away, never getting to see her daughter's killer brought to justice. Captain Ryder, I don't even begin to know how to thank you for all the time and effort you have put in on Melissa's case. I can never repay you, but I want you to know I appreciate your kindness, patience, and consideration to me. In spite of the fact that you have so many other responsibilities, you still find time to chase down leads you feel are a wild goose chase 
just because I ask you to. I want you to know I do not take that for granted. If you have any information about the Melissa Witt case, please call this anonymous no cops tip line at 1-800-440-1922 or visit whokilledmissywitt.com. Help us get justice for Melissa Witt.